of the History Museum. Um, you can find her at the Hans Beta House. If you have not been over to see the new expanded History Museum, um, we've got a second building now, and that's where Samantha is. Um, and she's going to be um, talking to us about the other side of the Cold War. What was the Soviet experience like? Um, and Samantha has uh, her master's um, in history from Texas Tech University. Um, so it's going to be a really interesting talk. Um, two little housekeeping things before we get started. I'm going to pass around an email list. If you're interested in getting emails from the Creative District, which is the sponsor organization of ONTAP, just put your name and your email address, so I'll send that around. Um, and also, um, as a housekeeping thing, there's a pub crawl going on tonight that you may have heard about. And uh, about the time that we end this, the pub crawl will be arriving here. So if you want to continue your evening, at about 7.30, the Hill Stompers are going to be showing up and you can have a whole other experience going on tonight. Uh, so give you a heads up that that's, that that's happening. Um, but we can get started with, um, with History on Tap. Do you want to start with some questions? A Okay, great. Okay, well, we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Samantha Lepard, and like Amy said, I work for the History Museum, and I'm a grad of Texas Tech. I have my master's degree in Soviet history with an emphasis on Soviet culture and how Soviet culture was a form of diplomacy. And so I was very honored to be asked to speak at History on Tap because this was all I studied for my master's program, two whole years of my life devoted to culture in the Soviet Union. Um, I was kind of interested, and if people are feeling like they'd like to share, I'd love to maybe hear from people just to start things off and kind of get the conversation going with um, some different people's favorite, you know, people from history maybe. I realize we have way too many people to go around the room and do it all, you know, together, but if you have a favorite person from history and you'd like to volunteer it, I'd love to know about it. I'm going to go first. So my favorite person from history is Catherine the Great. And she's my favorite person from history because she was one of the first queens that had pretty much no right to be a queen. She was not from Russia. When she came to Russia, she spoke no Russian. She used to stay up and get colds when she was a teenager because she would walk on the stone floor of her room late at night in the Russian winters to stay up and learn Russian by candlelight. And she did a lot of bad things, but she was also a really great queen, and the people really loved her because she was so enthusiastic about Russian culture. So that's my pick. Does anybody have any favorites they'd like to volunteer to me? Just, sure. I was in a, a church somewhere west of London. Mm -hmm. And there was a, a grave here, you know, not a grave, but you know, a crypt. Mm -hmm. And it said Catherine Parr, which I guess is the last wife of Henry VIII. And they dug it up, they dug it up, I guess the church had been destroyed. And they dug it they dug her out of the ground and put her in the proper grave. And I, I thought that was I read a book about her, so I thought that was really quite wow. That's very interesting. Does anybody else have any favorite people from history they'd like to I'm Marie Curie. Why is Marie Curie your favorite? Um, because she helped discover radioactivity. It's a very Los Alamos answer. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and she also, uh, you know, my grand, my great grandma had breast cancer, and she made it so she could live ten years longer and have my grandmother. That's so wonderful. You're about to answer, sir. I was about to volunteer Khrushchev for a strange reason. <laughs> the, uh, the Tchaikovsky competition in the first Tchaikovsky competition in Moscow, when Van Cliburn went there. The Soviets really expected a Russian to win. This was supposed to be a big demonstration of, of the superiority of the Soviet system. And, but everybody loved Van Cliburn. And so the, all the apparatchiks, of course, went to Khrushchev in a terrible state. You know, see, they want to give it to me. American, that can't do that. Khrushchev has the, answer, has the right question. Was he the best? Yes. Well, give him the prize. <laughs> you know, a lot of things bad about Khrushchev, but I always admired that. That is a good answer. Do we have anybody else? Okay, so what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about culture in the Soviet Union during the Cold War. And so uh, just to get things started, I don't think there's probably anyone in the room that doesn't know what the Cold War is, but just in case, for the purposes of this lecture, the Cold War is going to be the time directly after World War II all the way into 1991. 
So right until the end of the Soviet Union, so 1945 to 1991. And uh, we're going to be talking about it today, right? The Cold War is over. Why are we talking about it today? Because I think, in my estimation, and I would wager in other people's estimation, that the Cold War and the effects of the Cold War are still massively being felt today, both in America and in Russia. Um, let me see here. So as Americans, or as people that live in America, I think that intuitively we're able to understand the American experience in the Cold War. American Cold War culture is still as much a part of culture today as it was back then, especially with millennials like myself's love of all things retro and nostalgic. Cold War culture in some ways feels just as present today as it was by the end of the Cold War. Um, but I don't think that we always know what was going on in Russia. A lot of it was obscured to Western audiences. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I don't think that Western audiences have always been particularly interested in what was happening in the Soviet Union, particularly when, during the Cold War, they were our number one enemy as Americans. Um, but today, in 2017, with the United States and Russia being <coughs> political giants on the world stage, I think that to understand how Russia got to where it is in 2017 and to be able to better understand where it's heading in the future. I think that understanding the Cold War and particularly the culture of the Cold War, which really gets down to what everyday people were feeling in the Cold War, is uh, as vital now as it's ever been. Because through culture we can understand what you know, the everyday men and women of the Soviet Union were really experiencing and how they perceive their place in the world. So, okay. So like I said, we're going to talk from 1945 to 1991, although obviously the most important and the most interesting time in the Cold War would be like 1950s, 1960s, maybe a little bit of the 1970s, but we'll talk a little bit about the stuff that came before those decades and a little bit about the stuff that came after. And of course, if there are ever any questions about the entire Soviet period and culture, when we get to the questions and answers, I'd love to answer them. Um, so what are we defining as Cold War culture? Uh, we're going to define it today as the music, movies, literature, art, sport, and fashion uh, that are unique to the Cold War period. So, and today we'll be focusing primarily on that height of the Cold War. So, American Cold War culture and attitudes, like I said, we kind of intrinsically understand these because they're part of our everyday life here in America, but it's typically defined in our minds, right, by that dichotomy between the intense fear of nuclear war and the sort of happy-go-lucky attitudes of popular culture of the 1950s and 60s, primarily. Um, that's not to say that there weren't serious moments, of course, but, I mean, primarily, it's sort of, uh, especially right the 1960s, I'm sure, what pops into your mind is free love, hippies, things like that. And so, uh, you know, there was also the rise of consumerism during the Cold War period, which is another definitive characteristic we think about often. The rise of purchasing power, particularly purchasing power of teenagers. Um, in 1958, the New Yorker published an article about the power of the American teen. And so this period, the Cold War period, the height of the Cold War period, from the American cultural perspective, is about what teens were interested in, what teens were into spending their money on. And, for the first time in American history, really, it was the youth of America, or the youth of any country, that drove the economy and drove the popular interests of a country forward. And so that's how we perceive American Cold War culture. But how do we then compare that to a country that had a, a command economy, an economy that was, you know, based solely on what the Soviet state, a bunch of old guys, wanted to produce for people? And so the Soviet attitudes towards Cold War culture, they had a similar consumerist boom in the post-war period. Um, despite being under Stalin's control from 1945 to 1943, a lot of the fear of mass terror had dissipated. It was still uh, a, a huge public memory, but in terms of mass terror actually being enacted by the Soviet state, that fear had lessened a great deal compared to the 1930s and during World War II. Um, the Soviet Union, and particularly the state's perspective on culture, was that it had both an internal purpose and an external purpose. The external purpose is pretty obvious. It served as propaganda to the Western world. 
into the third world on, um, you know, the spread of communism, the joys of communism, the triumphs of communism. The internal purpose, though, which I find to be much more interesting and much more integral to understanding Russian culture even to this day, is that it, it served as a way to level the playing field intellectually. So the idea being that previous to um, Stalin's rule, there was a group in the Soviet Union called the Intelligentsia, and they were the intellectual elites. They were the professors, they were the artists, they were the movers and shakers of the Soviet Union. And in a communist society, you can't have that, right? You can't have a group that's so clearly above everybody else in all these different ways. And so by making popular culture this high art Soviet culture, um, you know, Stalin hoped to achieve this uh, method that he could equalize everybody, that even you know, a proletariat worker who might work on machinery that might have, you know, little in the way of actual education beyond just practical, technical education could be just as worldly and knowledgeable as somebody who had, you know, received a PhD in art history, let's say. So that was the main purpose of culture in the Soviet Union, and there was definitely that emphasis on high culture in particular. Uh, the Soviet state, at least in the 1950s, was not extremely fond of pop music, of TV shows that were lighthearted, like game shows. During the Khrushchev period, this will completely change, but the original emphasis was really on that high art and, and bringing people all together to have this you know, extreme knowledge of uh, you know, paintings and classical music, things of that nature. It was a huge undertaking by the Soviet Union. 30% of their annual budget went to cultural programs. That's their total annual budget. So it was a big, big deal to them. They spent a lot of money. They spent a lot of their effort on it. Um, let me see here. So like I said, there was that emphasis on high art. There was also an emphasis in the early Stalinist period on socialist realism which, if you'll forgive me for saying, is the most boring thing ever. Socialist realism was this uh, idea that was um, put forth by the very top members of the, so of the Soviet state, which was that they were going to extol these virtues of the communist man and the communist woman. And so there's books like How the Steel Was Tempered, which is just about like a steel factory and the people who work in it and how like super great it is and there's a little bit of drama but <laughs> overall not the most interesting book of all time um high art was much more important at this time than it was in the west the idea being that high art was not only um, um, educational but it was also emotionally gratifying that was an oddly important part of the puzzle to the Soviet Union as well, that high art made you feel better emotionally, <coughs> and that the popular culture of the West was ultimately empty and hollow. Um, by the Khrushchev era, things had relaxed quite a lot. Western media was still illegal, technically, but the ownership of it was much more relaxed, and um, culture really, at this point, during the Khrushchev period, became a means for Soviet city, citizens to express themselves um, because that was really the, the birth in the Khrushchev period of choice. So you could only start listening to pop music on the radio for the first time ever. You didn't ever have to really listen to the popular music in, of the time coming from the Soviet side, which were uh, VIAs, which are these, um, they're like voice and instrument accompaniment bands is what it stands for. and. Um, they, were, they had music that was written to be all ages and like sing about the joys of living in the Soviet Union, essentially. And the Khrushchev period is really where you don't have to be listening to stuff like that if you don't want to. You can listen to radio shows. In fact, if you lived close enough to the Western border, you could listen to Western radio shows. And a lot of people liked to record those and distribute them further east. And that was obviously under Stalin, would have been a big no-no, but under Khrushchev it was much more relaxed, much more possible. And um, there was a mild fear that this would lead to westernization or Americanization. Um, but the state-held belief was actually that because Soviet culture was the superior culture, it would win out ultimately. And so while it was discouraged, it was never explicitly uh, criminalized, shall we say. Um, there, by the 1970s, Brezhnev comes along, and Brezhnev is like the biggest stick in the mud 
ever. So <laughs> he started cracking down again, but there was always already a really sophisticated black market out there, and so uh, it was kind of like a bell that could not be unrung by that point. Um, it was, once again, much more difficult, much more cracked down upon to have Western media, but um, you, you know, what could he do? People are going to distribute, you know, music if they want to. Uh, speaking of music, the early emphasis on music was classical music and opera, high art. Uh, but by the 1950s, pop music was becoming popular, and would you believe it, they loved the Beatles too, just like everyone else. <laughs> they loved the Beatles. Um, but it was a little bit harder to be a Beatles fan in the Soviet Union. Beatles cover bands became hugely popular because you couldn't have the Beatles actually play, and you couldn't really openly play the Beatles super loud and have a dance, but you could have a Beatles cover band, and then suddenly you've Sovietized the Beatles, right? Soviet cover bands of the Beatles were really popular. Um, there was a private, or, or private fashion industry in the Soviet Union, but it was very expensive. So a lot of times in the 1960s, what people would do is they would go and get um, public sector clothing, so the clothing that was produced by the, by the state textile companies, and they would uh, sew it, they would alter it to look like Beatles fashion. And so Beatles fashion was still popular in the Soviet Union, um, not as much as America because of availability, but still very popular. Um, like I said, VIAs became really popular, but none of them have really stuck around. They, they were kind of almost like listening to children's music, although I kind of think the Beatles sounds like children's music sometimes, <laughs> but even more so. Um, the biggest pop icon of the Soviet Union was Vladimir Vysotsky. He would write these very emotional, sometimes anti-government pop songs. They weren't really pop songs, uh, folk songs. He was sort of like Bob Dylan, but with like 10,000 times more soul. Um, I did not bring any visual or audio to like <laughs> But yes, I do say, go home, go on YouTube, look up Capricious Horses by Vladimir Vysotsky. Give it a listen. It's awesome. Um, movies in the Soviet Union. Movies in the Soviet Union. Soviet, Soviet people loved to go to the movies. They went to the movies so much. They went to the movies more than any other. The average Soviet saw 16 movies a year, which that's a lot. But on top of that, 22% of Soviets claimed in 1960 that they went to the movies at least one time a week. They went to the movies a lot. Um, the Soviet industry for film was small compared to Hollywood, but um, by the 1960s they were managing to put out, you know, at least a new movie every week to keep up with the demand for it. The early post-war motifs were mostly war. There was also, um, what's the word for it? There was... Trophy, trophy films where they had stolen uh, movies from the Nazi film industry right as they were exiting Germany after World War II and they just dubbed those into Russian. So um, those were really popular and war movies were really popular into the, into the 1950s. And, um, but then comedies, their comedies had a huge renaissance during the 1960s. Com Soviet comedies became really popular. And then Western movies were also very popular in the Soviet Union. In 1962, uh, 33 percent of all Soviets went to see a movie called The Amphibian Man, which was about a boy that undergoes surgery and he can live underwater. Uh, but 25 percent of all Soviets went and saw The Magnificent Seven. So that's one in four people went and saw The Magnificent Seven. So Western movies were still hugely popular there. Um, and Western movies, the only thing that really stopped a Western movie from getting into the Soviet Union was the censorship board. There was a censorship board, so not every movie was shown that you know, came out in the West. Mm -hmm. Um, so it did have to have a pretty tame story to be a Western movie and get shown. Like The Magnificent Seven, which is a Western, you know. But, uh, and then fashion. Like I said, there was a private and there was a public industry in fashion. Um, fashion in the Soviet Union, if you ever go look at pictures of them, they always look very well dressed, in my opinion. And the reason for that is that the state held opinion on fashion was that it should look like Western fashion, but with no fads. So they really liked classic fashion. Um, I think for women, they wanted you to embody Coco Chanel. For men, they wanted you to embody, maybe, I think, Hugo Boss. Mm -hmm. They just wanted that very classic, clean line. You wanted to look like Western fashion, but, um, you know, 
distinctly Soviet, all the same, um, not too Western. There was a private fashion industry, and that was much more relaxed, but it was just so extremely expensive that it was not in the price range of your average everyday Soviet citizen. And perhaps if you saved like all your money, you could have bought a couple of things, but just the price was just not worth it. Um, but this still, the rise of consumerism happened in the Soviet Union, just like it happened in America, and Goom Shopping Mall is actually one-fourth of Red Square. It's one whole wall. And um, Goom, during the 1960s and even the late 1950s, it would have rivaled shopping in America. It would have had, you know, very, very, very similar things to that. And the blue jeans. This is my, this is my personal favorite. So Levi's were super popular in the Soviet Union. Um, they were hard to get. You could get them in these private fashion shops, but it was just impossibly difficult to keep them in stock. Like, it was the type of thing, you know, you get two pairs of Levi's, they're gone within 10 minutes if you're a store. And it was just difficult for the ruble to compete with these um, pricing, the, the, with the pricing